ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا ما يهده الله فلا مضل له وما يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم ارسله الله بشيرا ونذيرا بين يد عيسى ما يطيع الله ورسوله فقد رشد وما يعص الله ورسوله فانه لا يضر الا نفسه ولا يضر الله شيئا اما بعد ما شر المسلمين يوصيكم ونفسي اولا فاتقوا الله عز وجل فان الله تعالى يقول بعد اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما ان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله At what time do you normally have the prayer for this second for this last 2:15 So we have some time uh, to elaborate and to give you a meaningful message in this uh, khutbah My message for you today is that we are in a season in which it is ripe for us to give the message of Islam to our neighbors, our friends, our classmates, our co-workers. We are in December, and as you know, Christmas is in the air. You go to the local mall to do your shopping and you hear the Christmas carols. I'm very familiar with all of these because uh, where I was born in Guyana in South America, uh, Christianity is a majority religion. And uh, so the carols were all around. Uh, we were even taught to sing them. When we went to school, we recited what is called the Lord's Prayer that comes out of the Bible uh, before the start of each uh, school day in our primary school years. Uh, so when I recite this now, some Christians are surprised. How did this Muslim imam come to know the Christian uh, prayer? Uh, but we as Muslims need to be familiar with our own message, the Quran. We also need to be familiar with the message of others so that we know the connections between the two. And, and that will help us to convey the message of Islam to them in a meaningful manner. I haven't introduced myself. Some of you know me, some of you do not. So let me say that uh, I am your humble brother from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And my name is Shabir Ali. And I'm here this weekend because you have an exciting banquet coming up tomorrow. You know all about that. And I'd like to see all of you there tomorrow so that we can together um, work to, uh, to, to make this expansion of this masjid a reality. It's already a magnificent, a beautiful masjid. And uh, obviously, it needs to get bigger. You have three different Jummah prayers, right? Uh, this is unusual. And uh, naturally, we should have everybody together at once in a larger gathering. And so the plan is to expand this masjid uh, to about four times its present capacity. Wouldn't that be wonderful, amazing? For me, that'll be a dream come true. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make this a reality. So it all starts tomorrow, and uh, I would like to see all of you there tomorrow, inshallah. All right, so now we are in December. We need, we need to give the message of Islam uh, to our Christian friends in particular, but to others more generally. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to give the message. Allah says in Surah Ali Imran, Let there be among you a group who invites towards what is good. And then it says in the end, And they are the ones who will be successful. So if we want to be among the successful people, we have to be giving da'wah. We have to call people towards the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the, those who invite towards what is good. The word for invite there is uh, da'a in Arabic, yad'u in the 
uh, in the present tense. And uh, the masdar, or the verbal noun from that, is da'wa. That, that's the word, da'wa. Uh, so nowadays we use the word da'wat among those who uh, speak the uh, Urdu language. Da'wat means you, you have, like you see, I have a da'wat in my house, means you're inviting people for a dinner, right? Well, okay, you can invite them for a dinner, or invite them for some samosas, invite somebody for a coffee, and use that opportunity to give them the message of Islam. In the uh, hadith in Sayyid al-Bukhari, it is reported that our Prophet wasallam said, Convey from me even if it is one ayah. And, and we all know at least one ayah. That's one ayah. That, that's calling towards the oneness of Allah. And if somebody embraces the oneness of Allah, that is his key to paradise. Even if he... Uh, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save and protect all of us, but if due to our sins we punish in the hellfire, this will be for a limited time. Eventually everyone will be taken out who has uh, said the kalima, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadar Rasulullah. In the Quran it is mentioned, Inna alladheena qalu rabbuna Allah thumma istaqamu. Those who say our Lord is Allah and they remain steadfast. تَتَنَزَّلُ عَلَيْهِمُ الْمَلَائِكَةُ أَلَّا تَخَافُوا The angels descend upon them saying, no, do not fear. وَلَا تَحْزَنُوا and, and do not grieve. نَحْنُ أَوْلِيَاءُكُمْ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا We are your friends in the life of the world. وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ And in the life hereafter. وَلَكُمْ فِيهَا مَا تَشْتَهُونَ uh, it, what, and uh, you, you will have therein whatever you desire. So the promise is given from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those who say the kalima of Islam and they remain steadfast on that, declaring that there is no God but Allah azza wa jal. So the Quran came to us as a message to be delivered to the other people. It's not enough that we just recite the Quran in our homes and in our masajid, but we need to give that message of the Quran to the other people as well. I'm not into giving fatwas, but uh, some people at uh, this time, they say, no, you should be exclusive. You know, don't, don't interact with the other people. To the extent that somebody may say, no, if you say Merry Christmas to the others, that means you are somehow... Um, acknowledging what they do and you're approving of what they do. Well, I, I don't see that. You're not approving of what they do. They tell you Eid Mubarak, so naturally if somebody is offering a hand to shake, you, you will shake their hand. But some fatwas were, were given in circumstances that are very different from our own, especially in the time of the Crusades or just following that. When Muslims saw that the non-Muslims are all gathering against us and they are killing us and so on, at that time nobody was in the mood to say marry anything to anyone because it was fight or flight. You had to protect yourself. But in situations like our own, where there are friendships being built, we use those friendships for the sake of conveying a message to the others. So you further the friendship by saying good words, like good morning. What do you wish for the non-Muslim that you see on the street? You wish them to have a good morning. There's nothing wrong with that. In Arabic they say sabah al-khair, uh, which means good morning. It's the same thing. You are wishing somebody good. You want good to come to them. Some Muslims walk around as if they hate everybody and they wish everybody would go to hell. Why do you want anybody to be in hell? Do you want anybody to have cancer in this life? No. You, you don't want that on your enemies. Why do you wish for somebody to burn in hell? We don't wish that. We wish for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to save them from hell. And how would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala save them from hell? His prerequisite is that you have the kalima. So we want to give them the message of Islam. We want them to adopt Tawheed. Even if somebody did not become a Muslim, but they at least adopted Tawheed, and they said that there is no God but Allah. There are many promises for that. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take out of the hellfire anyone who has even a, an atom uh, of, of faith in his heart. 
somebody who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not associating any partners with him. A hadith says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Oh my servant, even if your sins were to reach the clouds of the heaven, so long as you come to me seeking forgiveness and associating no partner with me, I will come to you with forgiveness reaching up to the clouds of the sky as well. So the condition is don't associate any partner with me. Do not commit shirk. So if people are committing shirk, we won't help them by isolating ourselves from them. We'll help them by associating with them so long as we do not commit sins ourselves in such association. And we will use that association to give them the message that came to them in the Quran from their creator, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So when people are thinking that they're celebrating the birthday of Isa salam, this is a good time to tell them, you know what? We believe in Isa salam. That should be our starting point. Our starting point is not something negative, but something positive. And Allah tells us in the Quran in Surah Ali Imran, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ Say, O people of the book, تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ Come to a word that is common between us and you. Allah na'buda illa Allah That we worship none except Allah. وَلَا نُشْرِكُ بِهِ شَيْئًا And that uh, we do not uh, associate وَلَا يَتَّخِذَ بَعْدُنَا بَعْدًا أَرْبَابٍ مِنْ So, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ Say, O people of the book, Come to a word that is common between us and you. Allah na'abuda illa Allah. That we do not worship except Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shay'a. That we do not uh, associate anyone as a partner along with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wala yattakhidha ba'dun ba'dun arbaban min dunillah. And let not anyone associate anyone as a partner with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's our starting point. Uh, something that is common between us and them. We start with something common. So we don't start by negating, we start by affirming. Okay, if you negate, you go to somebody saying, oh, you guys believe Jesus is the son of God. We don't believe that. You are negating. When you negate, what's in their minds? This guy is denying something. That's in their minds. So they see you as a denier. Don't put it that way. Don't give them the wrong impression. You're not a denier. You are a believer. So start by saying, we believe in Isa alayhi salam. Now they're curious. They want to know, what do you believe? So now you tell them, what is the source of our belief? It is the Quran. Uh, why do you believe the Quran? This is the word of Allah azawajal. This is a message from our Creator, my Creator and your Creator. So you need to listen to this message. Okay, what does this message say? It says that Isa salam had a God. It says that Isa salam preached to them. And he says, Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum Allah is my Lord and your Lord. So worship Him. Now we make connections between this and what is in their Bibles. In their Bibles, in the Gospel according to John, it says that Isa salam said to, to, to inform his disciples, he told his female disciples to go and tell my brothers that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Now we do not say that these are the actual words of Isa salam. We know that his words must have been delivered in the Aramaic language because that was the language that he spoke. The Aramaic language is a, a dialect of Hebrew. And the Aramaic language has now largely ceased to be a spoken language except in its Syriac form. The Gospels that contain the teachings of Isa alayhi salam today were not written in Aramaic nor were they written in Syriac. They were written in Greek. 
which means that the best you have is a translation of what Isa a.s. said. Translated from the Aramaic into the Greek documents that we have. And everybody knows that something is always lost in the translation. Uh, brothers, I'm getting signals from the back that we need you to move up. Please, move up, fill up all of the gaps. See, this is why we need to expand the masjid, right? We need this masjid to be bigger, inshallah, by the grace of Allah. Azzawajal. Please, move up. Shukran. So something is lost in the translations. Not only this, when you compare the Gospels one to another, you will see that there is a development in the way in which Isa a.s. appears. You will see that in the earliest of the four Gospels, the Gospel according to Mark, he appears to be a, a prophet, a human being, a, a special person to be sure, and he's also called Son of God, but that could be interpreted in a metaphorical way. But then you go to the next two Gospels, Matthew and Luke, and you see that he looks bigger and greater. If in the earliest gospel, he heals some people, now in the next two, he heals them all. So you see that the miracles become bigger and greater as you go from one gospel to another. If it was shown in the earliest gospel that he had some limitation, either in his power or his knowledge, the next two gospels improve upon the story to remove that mention of limitation. So now, in the minds of Christians, as we can see over the decades when these Gospels were written, the minds of Christians are changing in the way in which they perceive of Isa a.s. And each Gospel is almost like a milestone uh, capturing uh, the, the way in which Christians thought about Isa a.s. at a certain time, in a certain community. Until the last of the four Gospels, the Gospel according to John uh, presents Jesus as a divine figure who came down upon the earth in human flesh. This is a new conception that was not there in the previous uh, two, uh, three Gospels. It's only in the fourth Gospel where Isa a.s. is referred to as the Logos or the Word of God that came down, that was there with God from the very beginning of God creating things and that this now is the agent through which God created everything else. So this gospel presents Jesus in what academics call a high Christology, the highest of the four. And you can see then that over time Jesus has been uh, evolved in the minds of Christians. So he starts off as a prophet, he goes to be bigger in the next two gospels, then in the last gospel like he's going through the roof. Okay, so we're not saying that these uh, Gospels present Isa a.s. as he was. This is how Christians perceived of Isa a.s. And not only did they change the way in which his miracles and his acts are reported, but even his speeches. So his speeches change. In the go fourth Gospel, he speaks more like a philosopher. In the earlier Gospels, he speaks like a prophet and like a human being, and a wisdom sage. So there are two different conceptions of Isa a.s. It's in the fourth Gospel, the last of the four Gospels, in which Isa a.s. makes statements which Christians are more likely to seize upon as proofs that Isa a.s. is actually God, and that he claimed to be God, or claimed to be God in a special sense, different from everybody else. So other people might be called sons of God in a metaphorical sense, but in the fourth gospel, uh, here we have Jesus claiming to be the son of God in a special sense. So that the fourth gospel can write that Jesus is the only begotten son. And it's only in that gospel that he's mentioned to be the only begotten son. Whereas if that was a fact about him, you would expect that all of the Gospels would mention that fact. That would be the most important fact to know about him. Why would any Gospel omit that? It's like Cohen has been um, found guilty and he has all these measures against him. Fines and three-year jail term and whatever. These are the most important facts about him, right? Every newspaper, whether the Washington Post or I don't know if you have the Virginia Times or whatever, all newspapers would mention the same facts. Even when this is translated into Arabic, if you go read the Arabic newspapers online, you will find they will all uh, report these essential facts of the case. 
So if Isa claimed to be the only begotten son of God, this would be in all of the Gospels, not only in the fourth one. The reason it is in the fourth one and not in the other three is because this is a later invention in the minds of early Christians, and that's how it came to be represented. But what is curious for me is that even in this fourth Gospel, there are remnants showing that Isa was not claiming to be anything over and above other human beings. And hence our saying, where Isa says to his female disciples, go tell my brothers that I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So what does this prove? It proves that Isa has a God. He has a God. Just like you have a God, I have a God. We all have the same God. He has a God, and that is the same God that we all have. So Christians at this point may ask me, well, why didn't you take the part where he said, my father? But I would say to them, if you take that part, it's not only his father, but also the father of his disciples. But I'm not saying that I take this as the actual saying of Isa alayhi salam. I'm only saying that if Christians were to be serious about what they read in their Bibles, and they take this as a saying of Isa alayhi salam, they would have to conclude that he has a God. And that is our message of Tawheed to them. And this is the season to give them that message. Now I've mentioned in this khutbah that when they ask you, why do you believe the Quran? You would say the Quran is the word of God. Now I want to end by very quickly giving you some material with which you might answer their follow-up question. How do you know that this is the word of God? Now for a Muslim, you don't need any reason or proof. You just know that this is the word of God. But if you're going to explain this to somebody else who doesn't believe it already, you need to give them some proof. You need to give them some evidence, some further explanation. And you know some explanations already. If you search online, you will see videos and other material that teach you how to explain this. The Quran's correspondence with modern science, for example, showing that there is a mind behind the Quran that was not the mind of any person who lived in the seventh century. And that shows that this is the mind of God. The Quran's literary beauty and eloquence is challenged to other people to produce a book like this, and so on. I'd like to offer you something that only came up uh, very recently, discoveries about the Quran uh, that only became possible with our modern computer systems, because now it became possible to uh, plug the data of the Quran into computers and to measure and count things and see how things line up and we realize that things line up mathematically in the Quran. And this is evidence that the Quran was not designed by a human mind but was actually designed by the mind of God with everything in its precise place according to its precise measure. It has been found that there are things which come out to be the multiples of seven. And there are other things that come out to be multiples of 19. And sometimes the two coincide, leading to a very complex arrangement. And there are other things that do not necessarily correspond either to 7 or 19, but nevertheless, there are complex arrangements, and this is proof that somebody has arranged it like this. And, 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 we, and we know from the history of how the Quran came to be collected and passed down to us that it was not human beings who did this. And this is proof that this is a revelation from the Almighty God. I don't have much time, but I'll give you a quick example. You know that there are letters that begin some chapters of the Quran that are called mysterious letters in, by English writers. They call them mysterious letters because they don't know what this, this is, and nobody knows what these are. In Arabic, they're referred to as al-huruf al-muqatta'at, the disjointed letters, because they don't spell any word. You find, for example, Alif, Lam, Mim. Some people may say, okay, the Alif is for Allah, the Lam is for Jibreel, the Mim is for Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But of course, that seems rather remote. Uh, or somebody may say, maybe it stands for uh, Anallahu A'lam. I am Allah, uh, I, I know best. 
but or, or that seems also remote. How do you know that meaning as opposed to some other meaning? The result is that nobody knows what these letters are and why they are there. But Muslims have faithfully kept these letters as they are and just repeated them, we just recite. Alif Lam Mim. And we keep going. Now it is found that it makes mathematical sense. There are 29 surahs of the Quran that have these uh, numbers, that have these letters at the beginning. And 29 turns out to be approximately one quarter of the number of chapters of the entire Quran. The number of chapters are 114. A quarter of that is 28.5. So round it up to the next whole number, it's 29. That may be the reason why there are 29 surahs and Allah knows best. But we go further. We see that among the 29 surahs, there are certain, there are repeating patterns. So like Alif Lam Mim is found at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah, but also Surah Al-Ali Imran, and all the way to Surah Al-Rum, for example. So it occurs again and again. Alif Lam Ra occurs some fi in some five different surahs. So if we minus the repetitions, how many of these patterns are there? We realize that there are 14 patterns, which as you know is a multiple of seven, it's seven times two. So we ask, all right, uh, if we write out these 14 patterns, how many letters uh, would comprise the 14 patterns? It turns out to be 38 letters, which is 19 times 2. What did I say? 14 is what? 7 times uh, 2, right? So 14 patterns, which is 7 times 2. It takes 38 letters to write out the 14 patterns, which is 19 times 2. And if we say, okay, well, it, yes, so 38 letters, but there are only 28 letters in the, in the whole uh, Arabic alphabet. So minus the repetitions, how many letters of the Arabic alphabet are used in composing these uh, the 14 different patterns. It turns out that it reduces to 14 different letters of the Arabic alphabet. So that means half of the Arabic alphabet is used, 14 letters, which is 7 times 2. Now look more carefully at these Huruf um, Muqattu'at. Uh, Sometimes they are numbered as a verse by themselves. So Alif Lam Mim is a verse by itself. But Alif Lam Ra is not a verse by itself. So why are some verses and some are not verses by themselves? We don't know the answer to that. But when you look carefully, you realize that in 10 surahs of the 29, they are not mentioned as verses. And that means that the other 19 have them as verses. That means there are 19 uh, standalone verses which are just huruf muqatta'at. So we're back to the 19. You see the interplay between the 7 and the 19 as we just deal, deal with just these huruf muqatta'at. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the full wisdom of why they're there. Uh, but if we had more time, we would show even some more uh, fascinating things about these huruf muqatta'at. But time does not permit and you have things to do and we have to end this khutbah. But I want to end by uh, going back to where we began. It is the time of year in which people are concerned about Isa alayhi salam. Give them the message that we believe in Isa alayhi salam. Why do we believe in him? Because of the Quran. We couldn't be Muslims without believing in Isa alayhi salam. Why do we believe in the Quran? Because this is the word of Allah. It was not made up by any human being. How do we know it was not made up by any human being? We can give an example, like the example of the Huruf Muqatta'at. And this is just, we're just dealing with some uh, very small mention of some letters at the beginning of some surahs, and we're showing the mathematical patterns, which mean that everything is in place in the Quran precisely where they're supposed to be. Letter for letter, even letters that Muslims could not understand, they have just simply faithfully preserved them that as they are. And only in our modern times did we discover these mathematical relationships, which prove that there is a mind behind this, which was not the minds of the reciters. They just recited it the way they were taught, and now we're seeing the mathematical relationships, which point to another mind, the divine mind, the mind of God, who revealed to us this glorious book as a message for all humankind. Share this with your family, with your friends, with your co-workers, with your classmates. Let them know that this is a message from Allah to us and to them. And they are responsible for following this message as much as we are responsible.
ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به تعالى من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان سيدنا محمدا عبد الله ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ان الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا ايها الذين امنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما صليت على ابراهيم رحمه وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد وصلى الله تعالى على جميع الانبياء والمرسلين والملائكه المقربين والخلفاء الراشدين ابي بكر وعمر وعثمان وعلي ومن تبعهم بإحسان لا يوم الدين اللهم اغفر لنا ولإخواننا الذين سبقونا بالإيمان ولا تجعل في قلوبنا غلا للذين آمنوا ربنا إنك رؤوف رحيم ربنا لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا دينا إلا قضيته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا ميتا إلا رحمته ولا حاجة من حوائج الدنيا والآخرة إلا قضيتها يا أرحم الراحمين برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وأكمل السلام